Greetings in the name of Christ, the light of the world. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. As you can see, we have two candles lit on our Advent wreath, this marking the second Sunday of Advent. And I'm so glad that you chose to worship online with me. Today, we will read about another greeting from the Archangel Gabriel. Last week, if you were watching, we read about the angel's visit to Zechariah, father of John the Baptist. This time, he comes to Mary. There's so much to learn from Mary as we anticipate the birth of our Lord, beginning with her response to Gabriel. Let's begin our worship with prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, long ago you came to your people with good news, the announcement of the birth of our long-awaited Savior, Jesus. Come to us today, we who wait in the hope that your kingdom will come, your will be done. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. As in days of old, come to us, be born in us, and may the hope, the peace, the joy, and love that comes from you fill our hearts, that others may see you through us, and that we may bring your message of salvation to the world. Bless us today in our worship, even as you blessed Mary through the angels' glad tidings. Remind us that with you nothing is impossible. Hope of the world, may the peace that comes through faith in you enter our hearts, our homes, our community, and spread across the land. For we pray as your children, recipients of the greatest gift of all, a Savior, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. There's an Advent hymn published way back in 1642 by Gorg Weissel of Germany, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. And what fascinates me about this hymn, besides the beauty of the hymn itself, is the fact that it was written during the infamous Thirty Years' War in Europe, a devastating time that cost the lives of somewhere between four and a half to eight million people by rough estimate. At that time, that was at least half the German population, not including other nations. This, the cause, was a mixture of religious disputes, Catholics versus Protestants, and the desire for power and dominance. It turned into one great big European civil war with a near total collapse of civil order. It was a time of great despair. There's a scene from that period of a peasant begging for mercy in front of his now burning crops that were set on fire by soldiers. It said that to be caught out in the open like that by whichever side had found you was tantamount to a death sentence. And that's when Weissel wrote this hymn. Living in days of untold misery, violence, and ignorance, he wrote, lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, in the hope of a day when Christ will come in glory and peace and war will be no more. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates Behold the King of glory waits The King of kings is drawing near The Savior of the world is here Fling wide the portals of your heart Make it a temple set apart From earthly use for hands employ Adorned with prayer and love and joy Redeemer, come with us abide Our hearts to thee we open wide Let us thy inner presence feel Thy grace and love in us reveal. Thy Holy Spirit lead us on Until our glorious goal is won. Eternal praise, eternal fame Be offered, Savior, to thy name. The King of Kings is drawing near. The Savior of the world is here. Amen to that. Scripture for today is found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Hear these words. In the sixth month, 
The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Well, last week, if you were here, we read about Gabriel appearing to Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, as I mentioned. In today's reading, Angel Gabriel is on duty again, this time appearing to Mary. It's interesting, the only other reference to Gabriel is in the book of Daniel, when he helped Daniel understand his visions concerning the restoration of Jerusalem after it had been destroyed. And here in Luke's gospel, he brings news about the Savior of the world. And then we hear no more further about Gabriel. God's purpose for him had been accomplished, at least at the so far. The name Gabriel means God is great. He serves as a reminder that our lives find fulfillment when we show others the greatness of God's love. Amen. It's not about us, it's about what God is doing among us and with us and in us and for us. Indeed, such was the attitude of Mary when Gabriel paid her a visit. The truth is, Mary's first reaction was not, here am I, the servant of the Lord. At first, she did not understand what Gabriel was talking about. For a young woman to be told, greetings, favored one, the expression could mean only one thing, that she was about to receive the gift of conception. And if that were true, then it would be very troubling, since the actual wedding between her and Joseph had not yet taken place. They were legally betrothed as in fiancé, promises that were, at the time, binding by law. But the actual wedding was down the road a ways. It's complicated. But the point is, if she was about to conceive, as the angel said she was, the news would not be a blessing, but a curse in the eyes of the world. Zechariah's fault was not believing the angel. In Mary's case, it is not a fault. It's that she... struggled to make sense out of what Gabriel had said. So Gabriel explains it. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. You have found favor with God. Upon hearing this, Mary doesn't respond the way Zechariah did with disbelief. Instead, she says, and I love the King James Version, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Mary could have reacted a number of ways, but she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Didn't matter what the world might think. Didn't matter even what Joseph might think. The only thing that mattered was her acceptance of what the Lord was going to do through her and in her. A lowly, poor, peasant woman who stood to lose everything if it were true, but who trusted the words of the angel that she was indeed favored and not cursed. There's an old expression, bloom where you are planted. In Mary's case, she was about to bloom. She may not have understood the planting part, but she accepted on faith that she was indeed going to bloom and that it was a good thing. In the Navy, there's a person known as the detailer 
who in the end determines duty station assignments for all personnel. It's very uh, important then when you make that phone call to the detailer or when the detailer calls you that you listen very carefully when offered that first duty station option because 10 times out of 10, that's the one the detailer has in mind for you. And if that's not where you want to go, there had better be a good reason because chances are options two and three are not really that career enhancing if there are any other options. Of course, that same principle applies in other career opportunities. So if it is at all possible, you don't want to say no to that first option. It's much better when, like Isaiah, you can say, here am I, send me, or like Mary, here am I, the servant of the Lord. On a rare occasion when I was active duty in the Navy, I had the opportunity to visit with the detailer in person. And this time the detailer shared with me not one, but three options on a certain uh, occasion. I listened very carefully. Fortunately, I was far enough in my career to know how some assignments are viewed, and in the end I took the hard assignment, which happened to be the one that I would not have imagined for myself. I asked the detailer if I could first call my wife, which was not unusual, to, before making that commitment, and he said, sure. So I asked my wife what she thought about me accepting orders to get Mo, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. My wife, God bless her, said, you may have orders to get more, but I don't necessarily have to go. <laughs> but in the end, we all went. Even the dog, it was the only time our dog was placed on official government orders due to the nature of the assignment. That was nine years ago. And it ended up being one of the best assignments I could ever have. It wasn't easy. There were some very difficult times, including the loss of my beloved father, my wife spending five weeks at the Portsmouth Hospital, not to mention the 15-pound iguanas that love to eat your hamburger out of your hand, sometimes your hand too, and the 20-pound banana rats. You haven't really lived until you raise the hood of your car and find all your cables chewed up. That's what banana rats love to do best. One of the best assignments, though. I loved it. We don't always see God's greater purpose in the here and now, where God sends us what God wants us to do, the news God is bringing us. What may be a great disappointment seemingly can end up being a wonderful opportunity. As disciples of Christ, some of the toughest circumstances we find ourselves in can be a great occasion to witness our faith and offer hope and good news. Mary accepted on faith that what Gabriel said was true despite the way she would be perceived by the world, not to mention by her own betrothed. It would take an act of God and a little help from the angel to convince Joseph that Mary had not been unfaithful. But that's another story. Mary runs to Elizabeth's home with the good news. Interesting the way Luke describes it. She ran straight past Zechariah, didn't even greet him, ran straight to Elizabeth. Excitement was in the air. They, they laughed and shouted and squealed in faithy excitement and delight. John leaps in the womb of Elizabeth. Zechariah, he must have been somewhere in the background. Sometimes the best thing for men is to know when to get out of the way and let women rejoice in their own way. Here, in the anticipation of the birth of their two sons, in the light of God's promise. And I'll tell you a secret, because for Luke, it is a secret. The good news of Jesus' birth. It's the secret that the angel brought to very few people, to Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, once he came around, and to the shepherds. Now, in Matthew's gospel, to wise men too, but in Luke's gospel, to very few people, to the poor, the weary, the lonely, the hungry, the peasants, to those who were in need of a Savior. It was to people who would best receive such news. The good news did not come first to the rich, the powerful, the proud, the self-sufficient, but to those who long for salvation and who know that it comes from above. Sure wasn't something coming from anywhere else, not for folks like them. Mary breaks forth in song, what is known today as the Magnificat. God found favor in her lowliness, her humbleness, not because of her importance. One of the great truths of our faith is that God comes 
to those who know they need God. For those who don't need God, they have the reward. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. False piety, drawing attention to the good you do, the look at me, see what a great person I am, people who make it all about themselves, reveling in their own self-importance, they're not the ones who will receive the good news. They've already received their reward, says Jesus. But Mary, it came to her. Mary kept it humble. Elizabeth kept it humble. The shepherds kept it humble. Israel was told time and again to keep it humble. The greatest lesson offered to Israel through Moses and the prophets is that God did not choose Israel because of anything special about Israel. It was not because they were a great nation or mighty in number or had a mighty army. They were slaves, dirty, filthy slaves. The only reason they were chosen was because God loved them and because they needed to be saved. And they knew it. That's the reason God came to Mary. And it's the reason God comes to you and me, not because of anything we are or anything we do, but because God loves us, and because we know we desperately need that love, that salvation, that good news, like a candle needs a flame, like the ground needs rain. Only those who are hungry enough, thirsty enough, poor enough, broken enough, and desperate enough can really appreciate this. Some of us go through life for a long time, relatively unscathed. While bad things happen, we manage to make it through. But sooner or later, something happens that brings us to our knees. The death of a loved one, a serious illness, loss of employment, bankruptcy, crippling debt, a crumbling relationship, people who turn out not to be at all who you thought they were. As a minister of the gospel, I see more people than you would imagine in desperate situations. Sometimes situations that are completely out of their control. Other times it is the product of their own undoing. I warn people not to fall prey to the sin of the three B's. The three B's. And I encourage you to write this down. Uh, I don't ask you to write things down very often, but I, I suggest that you write this down. The three B's. Are you ready? Bed, bucks, and booze. People pave the way to their own destruction through any number of vices, but the most common ones from what I have seen are the three B's. Bed, bucks, and booze. Being in the wrong bed with the wrong person, sexual impropriety, the improper use of money, and alcohol or drug abuse or any combination of the three. 90% of the time, people who do it to themselves, who make shipwreck of their lives, do it as a result of one or more of the three Bs, as I call them. In this world, you've got to protect your heart. If you don't protect your heart, it's prone to wander and do things it wants to do, not what God wants you to do. So you've got to be careful. You've got to lean on the Lord. Only God can save you from the many slings and arrows of outrageous fortune life throws at you, which are out of your control. And only God can save you from the things that you can do to yourself and others if you trust in your own merit, your own goodness instead of the goodness of God. Only God can save you from you. Only those who have been in the desperate need of grace understand this, understand what salvation is, true salvation. Those who trust in other things, they already have their reward. Recently, many of us in Iowa learned of a financial tragedy that occurred in a sister church in Mason City when their financial records keeper was found guilty of embezzling over $270,000 from their church. It's now a matter of public record that she was a woman. that She is now serving 27 months in a federal prison for wire fraud, having written checks to herself with the church's checkbook, paying off credit card bills, personal credit card bills, and increasing her payroll checks. She's in prison now, plus she has to return all the money she stole with interest and will be on probation for several years after that. The things people do thinking they don't and won't get caught. Hopefully she's learning to trust in other things besides mammon. 
There's a reason our money reads, in God we trust. Not in the paperback dollar, not in the coins, not in humanity, but in God alone. When I shared this with our church council, I asked those who were entrusted with our church finances to explain how we handle money to prevent things like this with several people counting for every penny, an annual audit, regular reporting to the council, accuracy, competency, responsibility, accountability, transparency, all these things. We have good internal controls that help protect our church contributions as well as protecting the reputations of the people we place in charge of handling the church funds. It was a painful lesson for that church in Mason City to learn as victims of that crime. It's why your pastor uh, has zero knowledge of how much people give to the church and absolutely zero access to church contributions because of the temptation. Now, I'd like to think I would never do anything like that, but don't give me the church's checkbook or credit card in the church's name. It's one of the most common ways clergy get into trouble. Remember the three B's. Our trust is not in the things of this world, nor in the goodness of humanity, no matter how great the intentions, but in the goodness and the grace of God alone who can save. That's why Mary listened carefully to Gabriel that day. Proverbs 3 reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. It'll save you from a world of hurt, including the hurt you could oppose on yourself and impose on others. Mary, the mother of Jesus, trusted in the Lord and not her own insight, despite the implications. She couldn't see what the Lord saw. Had she trusted in her own insight, she would only see trouble ahead. And there was trouble ahead. And this is what makes the story of the angel's announcement to Mary spellbinding. Knowing that there was trouble ahead, Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. This poor, lowly peasant woman who learns that she was blessed with a child out of wedlock, who would later be tried and executed as a common criminal, her son. News that would not elevate her public status, news that would not bring wealth and prosperity, news that would soon make her life more difficult and more complicated than ever before. And she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. That's a miracle. The Immaculate Conception of Jesus, to be sure, that's miraculous. But there is another one. Mary's embracing the good news and her obedience in light of the scandal of the good news. Her obedience to God, which was nothing short than an act of great faith. In the Protestant tradition, you and I do not venerate or pray to Mary as, we, as if she were divine. We don't do that. That's not our understanding of Mary. But you've got to hand it to her. She had a bold faith. She said yes to God, knowing from the view she had that the way would be awful rough. Here am I. Mary's favored by God. You and I are favored when we put our trust in the Lord and not in our own devices, which often leads to vices. Remember the three Bs. You and I are favored when life gets out of control and we turn to the one who can help, the only one. You and I are favored when we stand in the need of grace every single day, whether it's a good day or a terrible day, whether rich or poor, healthy or sick. We are favored when we realize that with every breath we take, we are at our core sinners in the need of a savior. The good news, the great and spellbinding news is that to such as us, sinners in the need of salvation, to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, a savior. We know we need a savior and knowing that makes all the difference. He then comes to us with hands reaching out to hold us. I was driving in downtown traffic a few weeks ago and came to a stop at a crosswalk. There in front of me were 20, and I, I counted them, 20 little children, boys and girls, little children, all holding hands with the daycare worker taking the lead and the daycare worker in the rear, 
all of them holding hands and navigating across a busy street. I thought, how fragile they are. How completely dependent they are on those daycare workers to get them across that busy street and on each other as they created a human chain with their little hands. Sometimes children like to, to exercise their independence and don't want to hold hands, but out there in the middle of the, the street, it was clear to them that holding hands was the only way to go, the only way to be safe. I picture the church the same way. God's children, each holding the other's hand, trusting in the big hands to lead the way across busy streets in the middle of heavy traffic all the way to the other side. Trusting the master's hands, we are able to take the hands of others and move forward in life. There's a children's song in our hymnal, the Methodist hymnal, 273, if you ever want to look it up. Jesus' hands were kind hands. The first verse goes like this. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all, healing pain and sickness, blessing children small, washing tired feet, and saving those who fall. Jesus' hands were kind hands, doing good to all. And isn't that the gospel message? The good news for Mary, for you, for me, the birth of a son who can save those who fall, which is all of us. He takes us by the hand and calls us to take others by the hand and go through life together all the way to the other side. You want my advice? All I would say is, don't let go. Lord Jesus, teach us to trust you, to take you by the hand, to go where you want us to go, and to say along with Mary, here am I, the servant of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, and therein find our salvation. In your holy name we pray, amen. Go in peace. May the blessings of Christ our Savior keep you in love with God and your neighbor. Do good in all that you do. May the Lord bless and keep you. Bye now.